Thanks, Jimmy. Good morning. Good morning. You can take your seat. Good morning. Thank you so much. That was so kind of you guys. Love being here in Houston with you here at Grace. Um, we do have our EXO conference here every year, and we absolutely love it. Pastor Garrett is one of my dearest friends. I just love him. I love him, love him, love him. Uh, what you see when he gets up here is exactly the kind of person that he is behind the scenes. Man of God, wonderful man, always so gracious uh, with us when we come here. So it's just great to be with you. And I want to talk to you today about the end times. I want to, we're going to talk about the rapture of the church. I want to talk to you about just the whole doctrine about the rapture of the church. Now, I got saved in 1973 and uh, my wife and I got married in 1973. I got saved a week before we got married. And the year after that, in 1974, I bought a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. Anybody ever heard of that book? Okay, so I read that book and it was about, I didn't know any of the Bible at that point in time, but it was about the end times. Uh, and I was absolutely fascinated by the concept that there was a book that predicted the future. And so I read his book, fascinated by it, I looked up all the scriptures in, the, in, in his book, even though I didn't know much of the Bible. And I realized 27 to 30% of the Bible's prophecy. And most of it relates to the days that we're living in right now. This is the most prophesied about period of time in human history. And some people say, well, why is there so much prophecy about the time we're living in? Well, number one is it's gonna be the most severe time in human history. Jesus said of the tribulation, unless those days would have been cut short, no flesh would have survived. But for the sake of the elect, I'll cut them short. And so the tribulation period of time, we're in difficult times right now, but we're not in the tribulation. And you say, why do I say that? Because the rider on the pale horse in Revelation 6 kills a fourth of mankind. Three plagues in Revelation 9 kill a third of mankind. Revelation 16, all sea life dies. This is, this is cupcakes compared to the tribulation. And so the tribulation period of time that's coming up, God wants us to know about that because we're not going to go through the tribulation. I'll prove it to you in this message. Jesus is going to come and rapture his church and we're going to escape the last seven years on this earth. And that's really good news. I'll prove it to you in the scripture this morning. But the other reason there's so much prophecy about this generation is because more people are alive right now on earth than ever lived in the history of the world. During the times of Jesus, most experts believe there were around 200 million people on the earth when Jesus was on the earth. And so we have almost 8 billion people. This is completely unprecedented. There has been an explosion of the population, especially in the last century. And so God wants us to know what's happening. And he's told us graphically in the scriptures what's going to happen. And that's what I want to talk to you about in this message. And this, the, the title of this message is, what is the rapture of the church? And I want to answer that question. Some of you may have never heard of it before. Some of you may have heard of it, but maybe you're confused. Some people say it's going to happen at the beginning of the tribulation. Others say it's going to happen at the end of the tribulation. Well, I want to tell you what the scripture says very clearly about what the rapture of the church is. Well, let me read a scripture. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the clearest text in the Bible about the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. When it says sleep in Jesus, their bodies are laying down here. Their spirits are in the presence of Jesus very much alive. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, notice that there, there are going to be people alive when Jesus returns for the rapture. Those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. Now let's stop right there. Those two words caught up, that is the Greek word harpazo. It is the Latin word rapturo. That's where we get our word rapture. Some people say, well, rapture is not even in the Bible. Well, it is if you have a Latin Bible. And so the whole concept of rapture, this is where it comes from. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. The word rapture means to snatch away. It means to seize hastily. If I ran in the room, grabbed you and ran out, that's rapture. And so in this case, it's an instant event that happens in the air. It's a private event between Jesus and the church. 
that happens in the air. Now, listen, there will be a generation of people who never die. Those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord is what he says here. Now, I want to be a part of that generation that never dies, don't you? I don't want to have a funeral. I don't want to have a grave. Someday in heaven, you know, they'll be saying, how'd you die? Well, I fell off a building. Well, how'd you die? Well, something hit me in the head. Well, how'd you die? Didn't. (laughs) Got raptured. I want to be one of the part of that generation. And so this is the truth. There is going to be a rapture and there are going to be those who have uh, died in Jesus. Their spirits are in the presence of Jesus. Their bodies are here on the ground. When the rapture happens, their spirits will be reunited with glorified bodies. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, will be raptured to meet the Lord in the clouds near. Here's another description, 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Well, that's the rapture of the church right now. The dead in Christ will rise first and we will all be changed. Okay. And it says there in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And I have, I have people ask me, they say, Jimmy, what if I'm in the shower when the rapture happens? And I always say the same thing. I hope you've been working out. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be flying through the air naked and everybody's going to be looking at you. It's going to be the most embarrassing moment. No, the word here, it says in a moment, it is the word atomos, where we got our word atomic. It is an indivisible amount of time. And so you can't have a shorter amount of time. Paul says here in the twinkling of an eye, that's one fortieth of a second. And so wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you will instantly be changed when the rapture occurs. It's an instantaneous event. Okay, so Jesus describes the rapture. This is, I'm going to read Luke 17, and I want to be very patient because this is a very important text talking about the conditions when Jesus returns. Okay, Luke 17. Jesus has been asked, by the way, when the end is coming. As the lightning flashes out of one part of heaven, shines into the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. By the way, that's the rapture. It comes from the east to the west. It's, a, it's a, an event that happens in the air instantaneously like lightning. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, notice here now, <clears throat> they ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day, not a day, the day that Noah entered the ark. Let's stop right there. This is not, a, this is not a, an indefinite article, a day. He's talking about one day in human history when Noah got on the ark. And here's the question I have for you. Did Noah get on the ark before the flood? Did Noah and his family get on the ark during the flood or after the flood? Well, that's a simple question. They got on before the flood, okay? Until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, okay, now remember, Sodom and Gomorrah was about to come under the judgment of hellfire and brimstone. And the angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah and they tried to get Lot and his family out. And so they ended up getting Lot and his daughters out. And here's what the angel said to Lot. We cannot judge this place until you're gone until you've arrived at your destination. God has told us this place cannot come under judgment. Now Jesus is talking about his return and he's saying, when I come back, okay, for my church, when I rapture you, because he's about to describe the rapture, when I come to rapture you, it will be like the day that Lot went out. And so the question is, did Lot go out before the judgment? Did Lot go out during the judgment or after the judgment? He went out before the judgment. They couldn't judge it till he was gone. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day, one day in history, just like the day that Noah got on the ark, just like the day that Lot went out. But even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he was on the housetop and his goods are in the house. Let him not uh, come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. Here it comes. This is the rapture. I tell you in that night, there will be two people in one bed, the one taken 
The other left. Two women will be grinding together. Well, actually, at the microwave together. <laughs> Sorry, ladies, you don't grind. The one will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one taken, the other left. And they answered and said to him, where, Lord? So he said to them, where the eagles are, wherever the body is, there it's, in, it's up in the sky. The, the bodies are taken up in the sky. Just like Paul said, we're going to meet him in the air. So, uh, you know, there are several things about this. One is it's a selective rapture. One taken, one left. Now, listen, it doesn't matter who you know if you don't know Jesus. You can be standing next to a Christian. They're going, you're staying behind. It doesn't matter if you're a member of a church if you don't know Jesus. Nothing matters if you don't know Jesus Christ. The deciding factor of whether you're taken or left is whether you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's all about a personal relationship with him. So notice here now, it's a selective event. Okay. Notice also that he talks about in that day and in that night. That's a little confusion because he's, he's talking about an event that happens all at once. Why would Jesus say in that day and in that night? Because when Jesus returns, half the, day will, half the world will be in daytime, half the world will be at nighttime. If Jesus comes at noon in Houston, well, it's not going to be noon everywhere. And by the way, God always goes off Jerusalem time, not off of Texas time. That's just wrong, isn't it? He's not a Texan. That's just wrong. I love him, but he's not a Texan. Okay. So Jesus is going to come and half the world will be in day and half the world will be in night. Well, this is an interesting word that Jesus uses here. He said two men will be, uh, two people will be in one bed, one taken one left. The word taken is the Greek word paralambano. And the word paralambano means to receive into yourself. If I walked up to you and I took you by the hands and I pulled you toward me, I'm receiving you toward myself. Okay, it's a very important word. You say, well, why would Jesus use that word? John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and paralambano you to myself, receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And so uh, Jesus left and he told the disciples, I'm going to leave and I'm going to tell you where I'm going. And I'm also going to come back. Now, when I leave, I'm going to my father's house. You can read a description of the father's house in Revelation 21. It is a 1,380 mile cube, which is glorious. 12 foundation stones. And so uh, when Jesus is saying this, they all know he's talking about a wedding. Okay. So let me explain a Jewish wedding to you for just a minute. When a Jewish man and woman were married, it started with a betrothal. And the groom left his father's house and he had the bride price. He had the dowry. And he came to the bride's house and they made a covenant. And in that covenant, they were legally betrothed. They had not consummated it yet. But they were legally betrothed. He paid the bride's price. Okay. Jesus left his father's house, came to the earth, gave his life for our sins and paid the bride's price. And after they were finished entering into betrothal, they had a glass of wine together. And when they had that glass of wine, it sealed the covenant. And then the groom said to his bride, I will not drink this again until I drink it with you in my father's house. And then he left. He went back to his father's house for around a year. And during that year, he built a chuppah, a bridal chamber in his father's house. And uh, after he was finished building the chuppah, his father examined it. And after examining it, he then had to tell him when to go back. And no one knew. The, the, the groom never knew. It was just arbitrarily, it won, typically in the middle of the night, because the grooms almost always came at midnight or in the middle of the night. The, the father would say to the son, go get your bride. Okay. So when he said that, the groom and his uh, company would go through the streets blowing the horn, the trumpet, all through the streets shouting, the bridegroom is coming. Now the bride had to be ready 24 hours a day because she had no idea when the groom was coming. And so she slept in her wedding dress. Now this, some of you ladies watch that show, say yes to the dress. Okay. It's not, it's not like a pajamas. You know, I understand that. Well, she had to sleep in her wedding gown because she knew he was coming in the middle of the night. She had to keep a lamp lit all night long. And all of her bridesmaids also had to sleep in their wedding clothes. And so the groom came, you know, just, I guess she wore makeup at night. I don't know back then, you know, but I mean, you sure wouldn't want, well, no, let me say, anyway, so she had to be ready 
at a moment's notice because the bridegroom would come through the streets and she had to get up and go to her wedding. So he would take her back to the father's house and they had a seven day wedding. So when Jesus is saying here, I'm going to go away, I'm going to my father's house and I'm going to build a mansion for you there. And as surely as I go away, I'm going to come back and receive you to myself so that where I am there, you may be also. That's what the rapture of the church is. Jesus has been, listen, if a Jewish man went away and built a house for a year, Jesus has been gone for 2000 years. Can you imagine how nice that place is going to be? And can I tell you, if you're a believer, you have a mansion in heaven waiting on you. And I hope you have a very nice home wherever you are right now. It is not your real home. It is a cheap substitute. Listen, the, the floors are transparent glass. It's, it's the most, you never have to pay insurance on it. You never have to have it cleaned. There are no re- maintenance or repairs. There will never be a thief break into your house. You don't have to lock the doors or have guns or anything like that. It is eternal. It is incorruptible and it is yours forever and ever and ever. And the best thing is you live in the presence of Jesus. That's where we're going. That's what the rapture is all about. Now, there are people that say, um, well, you know, Jimmy, thank you for saying all that you just said. By the way, Jesus said buying, selling, marrying, giving in marriage, planting, building. Business as usual. He said, when I come, just like the days of Noah, just like the days of Lot, business as usual. And there are some people that say, well, wait, Jesus, uh, yeah. But Jesus isn't coming before the tribulation. He's coming at the end of the tribulation. Okay. So, um, during the tribulation, over half of humanity dies. In Revelation chapter 8, a star called Wormwood hits the earth. But all of the, there are four trumpets blown in Revelation 8, and they're all regarding this one event of, a, of an asteroid hitting the earth. The first thing that happens is the atmosphere becomes superheated, and it begins to scorch the earth and burn up the grass and the trees. That's what happens when an asteroid enters the atmosphere. It becomes superheated. The second thing that happens is it says a great mountain fell into the sea. This is evidently part of the asteroid that separates and falls into the sea. A third of sea life dies and a third of the ships are destroyed. The next thing that happens is wormwood, bitterness. The star hits the earth and poisons the waters and hits the earth. The fourth thing that happens is the sky sky grows dark. That's what happens after an asteroid hits the earth. The debris goes up in the sky and it darkens the sky. Jesus was talking about the abomination of desolation, which happens in the middle of the tribulation. He said, there will be, after that happens, there will be great tribulation on the earth, so as, such as never happened in the world. And unless those days have been shortened, no flesh would have survived. And people say, yeah, but we'll be buying and selling, marrying, giving in marriage, planning and building. No, you won't. You'll be surviving. And if you do survive, you'll be going to 40 funerals a day. There'll be dead bodies piled up everywhere. There's not going to be business as usual at the end of the tribulation. That's crazy. Now, let me, let me talk to the ladies here for just a minute. Because the, the tribulation is wrath. It is the wrath of Almighty God. It's not just judgment. So let's just say that, and some of you ladies are single, but those of you who aren't single, just pretend for just a minute that you're single. I want to talk to you about this man that wants to marry you. Wonderful man. Perfect man, actually. Intelligent, handsome, rich. The biggest thing there is rich. But he's a good man. He's a wonderful man. He's a loving man. And he comes to you and says, I love you so much and I want to marry you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you, but I do have one condition, darling, my beloved. I'm going to need to turn you over to the most evil man in world history for seven years. And he's going to abuse you, torment you, persecute persecute you and probably kill you, but it's for your good. And let me tell you something, you're sure going to appreciate me more. Does that sound like a creep to you or what? <laughs> Ladies, would you want to marry a guy like that? Is Jesus mad at us? The tribulation is about God punishing a world that has rejected him. We have not rejected him. We have received him as our Lord and Savior. We're not going through that. Let me say this. There is a rapture at the end of the tribulation, though. 
And this is what confuses people. What I'm talking about is a pre-tribulation rapture where Jesus comes for his bride to rescue us and to take us to be with him for a seven year marriage supper as the world is going through seven years of tribulation. That's what I'm talking about. But there is a rapture at the end of the tribulation. Here it is. Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Couldn't be different, more different now than Luke 17, where Jesus said, like the days of Noah and Lot. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see. Now, this is a very public event now. This isn't private, like the first rapture. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And see, this is why some people read this and they say, see, the rapture is at the end of the tribulation. This is for the people who get saved during the tribulation. There will be hundreds of millions, if not billions, Millions of people who get saved during the tribulation. What about those people? By, by the way, in God's mercy, he allows those people who have rejected him to get saved during the tribulation. And also in his mercy, at the end, they're raptured and they join us. But they have been through a very severe period of time because they would not receive Jesus before that. And so let me, let me talk about the reason for the rapture here for just a minute. You say, well, why is there a reason? I mean, why is there a rapture? Well, first of all, to take us to be with Jesus forever. Okay. I mean, he, he's our bridegroom and he's there preparing a place for us. So he's going to come back and receive us into himself. But the second reason for a rapture is to deliver us from the wrath of the tribulation. Revelation 6, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, Every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who's able to stand. See, the tribulation isn't judgment, it's wrath. It is the absolute wrath of almighty God of every single person living on the earth during that time, believer and unbeliever. It is the wrath of almighty God. Okay. So have you ever been afraid of a lamb, by the way? Have you ever had a nightmare about a vicious lamb attacking you? If you have, you're a wimp. I want to say it to your face. You're just a super wimp. These lambs are these just precious little defenseless animals. But our lamb happens to be the supreme king of the earth. And he gave his life for the sins of the world. And he came in human form and they crucified him. And since the day that he was crucified, they've still been slapping him in the face and spitting on him and using his name as a curse name and rejecting him. As a curse word and rejecting him. And he's taken it and he's taken it and he's taken it and he's taken it and been gracious and gracious and gracious and gracious and gracious. But our precious Jesus is going to get enough one of these days. And he's going to come and he's going to take us out of the world just like he did Noah and Lot, a righteous remnant. And when he does, the wrath of the Lamb is going to be poured out on the earth. And the great men, the mighty men, every free, and, uh, free man and slave, let the rocks fall on us and protect us from the wrath of the Lamb. Who can stand before him? His day has come. And that day is coming very soon. And what I'm saying is, this is not for us. This is for a world that has rejected him. Let me read you a couple of not very nice scriptures. First Thessalonians, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come, not through from. He doesn't deliver us through it. He delivers us from it. Somebody say amen. 1 Thessalonians 5, but concerning the times and seasons, seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you for you yourselves perfectly know, uh, uh, know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pangs upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. This talking about the unbelieving world. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief for your sons of light and of the day. We are not of the day nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet of salvation and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Listen, 
For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also doing. Okay, so the Apostle Paul here is saying twice in the book of First Thessalonians, Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. We're not appointed wrath. So comfort each other with these words. So I'm, so I'm going to I'm going to take a couple of shots at comforting you. Okay, I'm a pastor, so I'm pretty good at comforting. So let, let me let me let me take a couple of shots at comforting you. Here's my first attempt. Um, Jesus loves you, but you're going to go through the tribulation. And you'll probably die. Have a good day. <laughs> How did I do? Anybody? Did I do good? You feel comforted? Uh, okay, no. Okay. Let me take another shot. Jesus loves you, and he's prepared a time of wrath coming in the world, but that's not for you because you've chosen him and not rejected him. So before that period of time comes, he's going to come and take you to be with him. And while the world is going through seven years of the wrath of the Lamb, you're going to go through seven years of the marriage supper of the Lamb. You feel better about that one? And it's true. Comfort each other with these words. We're seeing some bad stuff happening in the world right now. These are just birth pains. People say, Jimmy, are we in the tribulation? Absolutely not. This is nothing. This is a Sunday school party compared to the tribulation. But these are birth pains. Jesus was asking Matthew 24, what are the signs of the end? He said, there's going to be nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be problems in various places. He said, there will be famines, earthquakes, and pestilences. COVID-19. These are just the beginning of birth pains. We're in the birth pains. And the ladies know this. We men know this by observation. And that is when you're having a baby, you start having birth pains. And they start not so bad. Now, not so bad because we're men. Okay, so we would be in the hospital weeping. But they start not so bad. And then they get worse and closer together and worse and closer together. And you can tell how close you are to having the baby by how intense the birth pains are. Listen to me. I've never seen anything like what's happening in the world right now. The severity of COVID-19, and we have teachers in our public schools that are telling us that they, they can no longer call boys and girls, boys and girls. In the paper this morning, there is a Satanist, atheist, transsexual that just won an election for sheriff somewhere in America. The evil that is in the world today what is happening in the world today, these are severe birth pains and it's about to birth the return of Jesus Christ. And that's what we see happening. This is not the tribulation, but I believe, I don't believe we're living in the end times. I believe we're living at the end of the end times. Let me read you one more scripture here. This is Luke 21. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And that day, talking about the coming of Jesus, come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare. That's an animal trap. On all, those who, on all of those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. That you cannot get a more inclusive statement. Every single human. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy. Listen to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay. Jesus says, don't pray that you can endure it. Pray that you will escape it. I, worked up, I looked up the word escape in the Greek language. It means escape. It means get out, get out. Jesus said, pray that you would be worthy to escape all these things. He's talking about the end. Luke 21 is an end time text. I don't want, why would Jesus tell us to pray that we could escape if we couldn't escape? He could have used the word endure. You know, I want you to, I want you to build a bunker. I want you to go buy food and guns so you can shoot your neighbors. When they come to get, when they're starving and they come to get your food, I want you to shoot them, but you're going to endure. He didn't use the word endure. He used the word escape. On the day that Lot, on the day that Noah got on the ark, and by the way, the ark was a massive ship on dry ground and it never rained on the earth and he didn't have a trailer to pull it to the lake. What an idiot this man looked like. Can you imagine the ridicule that he endured by people around him? He's building a massive ship on dry ground. It had never rained on the earth. But on the day the rain started, he looked like a genius. Many of your family and friends are making fun of you for your beliefs. They'll make fun of you if you believe this. But I'm telling you, the day of the rapture, you're going to look like a genius.
Noah got on the ark, the door closed, the world was ensnared in judgment. Lot left Sodom and Gomorrah with his daughters, the world was ensnared in judgment. When the rapture happens, as soon as it happens, Jesus said, it will, take, it will be as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. The only ones not ensnared are those of us who have chosen Jesus now. Well, I want to say there are people that teach that we're going to go through the tribulation, but God's going to supernaturally protect us. Let me deal with that here for just a second. A couple of scriptures, Revelation 13. He was given a mouth, this is the Antichrist. He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. That's the abomination of desolation in the middle of the tribulation. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, nation and tongue. Well, you can kind of dismiss that theory that the believers are going to be protected. Let me read one more scripture. Revelation 20. I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Behead. That's a really cruel way to kill somebody. By the way, that's the signature execution of Muslims. And there are many who believe that the Antichrist actually will be a Muslim. And Daniel 9 says the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. In AD 70, that scripture was fulfilled when the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem and the Temple Mount and the temple. The Romans did. And some people say, well, the Antichrist is going to come out of the revived Roman Empire. That's true. But in the days of Jesus, the Roman Empire included the Middle East and Northern Africa. There's a book right now, three times in the Old Testament, the Antichrist is called the Assyrian. And there's a book called the uh, uh, Muslim Antichrist, the, uh, the Islamic Antichrist by Joel Richardson. Very, very good book that makes a very strong case for the fact that the Antichrist could be a Muslim. Could be. He, he could be Swedish. You know, we don't know. But there's going to be an Antichrist and he's going to be a very evil man. And he's going to, there's going to be mass martyrdoms. If you are alive, the blessing of receiving Jesus now is you're going up in the rapture and you're going to have a wonderful seven year period of time. The curse of not receiving Jesus now is if you receive him during that time, you'll probably die. If not by one of the plagues, by the Antichrist. And you won't be able to buy or sell unless you take the mark. And so, bad time. But we have good news. This is all good news. Will children go in the rapture? Okay. Yes, up until the age of accountability. So a lot of people, mothers, you know, will say, you know, what, what if I'm raptured, will my children stay here? Will my baby stay here? Well, they'll go with you up till the age of accountability. Now, if I said to you as parents, Christian parents, if I said, you're, good news, you're going to go in the rapture. Bad news, your children are going to stay here. Well, on some days you would say, okay, I'm good with that. Uh, <laughs> Be good for them. But every Christian parent or grandparent would say this. If they don't go, I don't want to go either. Right? I don't want to leave my babies here. If they don't go, I don't want to go. Okay, so I'm going to use the age of 13 as being the age of accountability. And the reason I'm going to use that, and this is my opinion, is because of the Jewish tradition. A Jewish boy is bar mitzvahed at 13 years old. He becomes legally responsible for his own decisions and he becomes an adult at 13 years old. A Jewish girl is bat mitzvah. Bar means son, bat means daughter. Bar mitzvah means son of the commandment. And so Jewish boys and girls both go, both go through a rite of passage when they turn 13 where they're legally adults. Now most theologians believe that the Virgin Mary was 15 or 16 years old when she gave birth to Jesus. Now this is not our world, but that was their world. That was common back then. Uh, people, young people got married when they were 14 or 15 years old and started having children. And so she was around probably 15 years old. And so at some point in time, your children become responsible before God for their decisions. I'm going to say 13. I may be wrong, but somewhere around there, I think. So let me say this to mom and dad. Your number one responsibility as a parent is to lead your children to Jesus Christ.
at two or three years old, four years old, children can understand Jesus. They can love Jesus. I think they need to be old enough, four, five, six, seven, before they can really make a genuine decision for themselves. I know some of you may have gotten saved when you're three. That's great. But I think there has to be an age where they come into consciousness, where they're able to make that decision, able to be baptized, you know, and things like that. But the earlier, the better, you know, as long as they're old enough to make the decision. When they turn 13-ish, there's a point in time there now where they're going to be responsible for their own decisions. And if you have a teenager who doesn't know Jesus or an adult child doesn't know Jesus, two things, pray for that child every single day. Number two, live a lifestyle in front of that child that makes Jesus attractive to them. Don't try to shove Jesus down their throats. But live a lifestyle that makes Jesus attractive to them and just pray, pray, pray. I've got relatives that don't know Jesus. My, one of my brothers, I pray for him constantly that, that you know, he'll come to know Christ. And so pray, pray for that person. But I'm going to say your children are going. And that's a comforting thing. Up to around the age, of, up to the age of accountability, your children are going with you, so don't worry. Now, some people say, "What about the children of unbelievers?" I just don't know. Let me let me tell you something beautiful about heaven, uh, in hell. Something horrible about hell. Um, all children up into the age of, of accountability who die go to heaven, but hell has no children in it. Every baby that's ever been aborted is in the presence of Jesus right now. Heaven is full of children and babies, but hell is empty of all of that. So just understand, it would be completely unlike Jesus Christ to come and take us and leave our children behind. He's not gonna do it. One more thing, when will the, when will the rapture occur? Uh, tomorrow. Did I say that? Sorry. No. Um, when will the rapture occur? Well, I'm going to tell you when it's going to occur, uh, not the date or the time, but I'm going to tell you when it's going to occur. Leviticus 26, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. Well, the word feast means an, a festival or a point of festival. The word convocation means dress rehearsal. I want you to have seven feasts, four in the spring, three in the fall, and these are going to be dress rehearsals of future events. Okay, So we know that the seven feasts of Israel tell us the future in advance. How do we know that? Because the first feast is the feast of Passover, and Jesus was crucified on the feast of Passover, the very day. When a lamb was being killed and his blood was being put on the doorpost of the house, Jesus was being killed as the Lamb of God. Jesus was buried during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Jews couldn't eat leaven for seven days. Leaven represents sin. Seven is the number of perfection. Jesus perfectly removed sin from the human race. So for seven days was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus was resurrected on the Feast of first fruits. The priest would go and take the barley harvest, the first of the barley harvest, and wave it before God. Jesus was resurrected during first fruits, and 1 Corinthians 15 says, Jesus is the first fruits of many brethren, resurrected from the dead. Fifty days after first fruits was the Feast of Pentecost. Fifty is the number of perfection, completion, freedom, fullness to the Jew. It's the Jubilee number. Fifty days after first fruits was Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the priest would go and wave two loaves before God. And this represented the fullness of the Jews and the Gentiles coming in. And on the uh, Feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon the upper room and the church was birthed of Jews and Gentiles, Jews immediately, Gentiles shortly thereafter. And so the fullness of God came. Every feast, the first four feasts have been literally fulfilled to the day in order. They have to be fulfilled in order. You say, well, there's three more feasts. They're the, they're the fall feasts. They're about to happen. They begin next weekend. What are the next three feasts? The next one's trumpets. That's the rapture. The rapture will occur some year during the Feast of Trumpets. Remember, the seven feasts tell us the future. It's going to happen in sequence, and every one of them is a dress rehearsal of some future event. Ten days after trumpets is Feast of Atonement, holiest day in, in Israel. This is the day that all the sins of Israel were forgiven, and so this is the, the second coming. This is when Jesus physically returns to the earth, and he atones the earth through his presence and his rule. Five days after that, there was a seven-day feast called Tabernacles. Tabernacles was a seven-day feast that happened in the seventh month 
uh, of the year. Okay. And so this for seven days. And so this was seven, seven, seven perfection. This is eternity with God. The last thing that happens is we spend all of eternity with God. Let me go back to the Feast of Trumpets. Why do I believe that Jesus is coming during the Feast of Trumpets? Because trumpets is linked with the rapture. First Thessalonians, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. First Corinthians 15, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound. And by the way, to the Western mind, we hear the term last trumpet. Doesn't mean anything to us. Does to a Jew. During the Feast of Trumpets, they blew the trumpet a hundred times. They blew the ram's horn, the shofar, a hundred times. But the longest and loudest blast was the last one, and it was called the last trump. At the last trump, Jesus Christ is going to come during the Feast of Trumpets. Let me tell you one other reason that I believe that Jesus will come during the Feast of Trumpets. And it is the oral tradition of the Jews. The Jews have been keeping the feast for 3,500 years. And they have a, 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 an oral tradition called the Mishnah. And here's what the Jews call the Feast of Trumpets. They have many names for it. One is Rosh Hashanah, which is the head of the year. Uh, next weekend begins a new year in Israel. Okay, So the, trumpets is a, the Feast of Trumpets, the rapture is a new beginning for all of us. It is the day of the awakening blast, Yom Teruah, the day of the awakening blast, 1 Thessalonians. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead will, and Christ will rise first. It awakens the dead from their grave. Yom Hadin, referring to the day of judgment. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. When Jesus returns, we are judged, and it's a judgment of rewards. It's not a judgment of heaven or hell. We're going to heaven, but it's a judgment of rewards. It happens at the rapture. Yom HaZikaron, which is the day of remembrance. Uh, the, the rapture is a selective event. On the day of the rapture, he remembers who belongs to him and who doesn't. Okay. It is also known, listen to these two, the wedding day of the Messiah. The Jews believe that the trumpets is the wedding day of the Messiah and the day which no one knows. Okay. It's a two-day feast. Jesus said in Mark 13, of that day and hour no one knows, not, in, not even the angels in heaven, uh, not, 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 the, not the Son, but only the Father. So next weekend, beginning at Friday sunset, uh, this next weekend on September the 18th, trumpets begins. Now, God goes off of Israel time, so that's seven hours earlier than us. So next Friday morning in Israel, trumpets begins and it's a two-day feast. And it ends sundown on Sunday the 20th. Okay. Now, if I told you Jesus was coming next weekend during the Feast of Trumpets, and I'm not saying that, so don't leave here saying that. Okay. Good. He'll come some year during the Feast of Trumpets, I believe. If I told you he was coming next weekend, you still wouldn't know the day or the hour. When Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour, he was effectively saying, I'm coming in trumpets, the day which no one knows. And so some year... Jesus is going to return for his church, the Feast of Trumpets. They have to happen in order. The first four happened in order. The next one is trumpets. Trumpets is the rapture for all the reasons I just told you there. And so will it happen next weekend? I hope so. I hope it will happen. The other thing I hope is I hope you're ready. If you're a believer, I hope you're, I hope you're right with God. And you don't have to be perfect. None of us are perfect. You don't have to be perfect for, to be taken in the rapture. You just have to be his. You just, you just have to know Jesus. That's, that's all. If you're not ready, I hope this message will encourage you to get ready. If you're, if you're not living for God the way that you should, I'm just telling you, we're living at the end of the end times. That this is a very, very serious time in human history. And God is announcing his coming through these birth pangs and through these events that were prophesied in the Bible. And so there's, without excuse, by the way, did you know that every time the Bible says that Jesus comes as a thief in the night, he's talking about unbelievers? First Thessalonians 5, Paul said that they should not overcome you as a thief because we have prophecy. We know, we know the season which Jesus is coming. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never given your life to Jesus and made him your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. This is the most important decision you'll make in all of eternity. This decision determines where you will spend eternity. It also determines whether you're going to be taken or whether you're going to be left. I want you to bow your heads with me if you would. Lord, we come to you and we just present our hearts to you, Lord, is we want to be ready when you come. We're, we're very imperfect people. We need grace. We need a lot of it. 
but we want to be ready when you come. And if there's something in our lives right now that we would be embarrassed when you come, you're more important to us than that thing, Lord. You really are. And we forsake it, we put it away and pray that, Lord, that you would fill that area of our lives with your presence and give us grace and power to overcome any sin that has tried to ensnare us. But for those who don't know Jesus, I want you to just keep your head bowed there for just a minute. If you don't know the Lord and you want to receive the Lord, I want you to say these words, just repeat after me, say, Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you. And I invite you to come in to be my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and I ask for your forgiveness and I receive your forgiveness. I believe that I'm forgiven. I ask you to give me the gift of eternal life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the power to change and to serve you. I dedicate my life to you from this point forward. In Jesus' name.